It's We'll see how long it lasts. All right, so that will essentially be all the major topics that we need to know um, for the final exam. So now I'll kind of 
go through and kind of refresh your memory. Much of this ties to Gen Biochem, right? So the things that we cover in advanced biochem, nitrogen metabolism, fatty acid oxidation, fatty acid synthesis, replication, translation, transcription, and translation, right? So those are the um, kind of the newer stuff. And then one other topic here is the mTOR pathway. Okay. So we have a lot of this material in Gen Biochem. So that's where you're going to want to focus most of your studies on, right? So if you recall, the final could be 60 questions. The first 40 questions are the exact same 40 that you had during your Gen Biochem final. All right, so that's the core exam that you took on uh, Gen Biochem. Now there's an additional 20 questions. All right. Four of the additional 20 questions will be replaced because this material we didn't cover really dives into molecular biology stuff. Um, and then two questions from the core 40 that tie into molecular biology stuff like um, vectors and uh, restriction enzyme stuff will also be replaced. So just like the core exam, six total questions will be replaced. Um, and then, but then you'll have your, so you'll have your raw 60 questions that you'll answer, and then six additional questions that you answer, which then I use to replace the six that are um, there. So the way then that'll work is, so let's say you guess correctly two out of the six questions that'll be replaced because we didn't cover it, so it's a pure guess. And you get well, correctly two. Huh? Well, unless you take molecular biology. Well, then that's true. <laughs> that may not be a true guess, though, but, but, but it's something we're not going to. But if you get two of them right, right, whatever the case may be, because you had molecular biology or you guessed correctly, then that's fine. And then let's say of the six questions that are replaced, you get five of those correct. All right? And let's say on your raw score, you get 42 out of 60 correct. Then what I would do is I would take the number you got right that are replaced and subtract away the number from the raw score that you got correct, which you guessed or that are being replaced. So then it'd be five minus two is three. And then I would take that three points and add it to your raw score of 42. And then you would have a 45. Out of 60. And then I would go refer to the percentile chart. It's 45 out of 60. It, the actual percentage is 75%, but I believe on the final exam, based on the national average, I think it's somewhere up into like 80, 82 or 88 percentile, somewhere up there. Right? Then I would take that percentile, multiply it by the points, total points for the final exam, and that will be your final exam score. All right, so similar how I did in Gen Biochem. I take the percentile. If you score a percentile in which it's actually more beneficial for me to just take the multiplying effect for each uh, question, all right? So if the exam is 150 points, each question is worth 3.75. If it's more beneficial for me to just take the number correct times 3.75 compared to the percentile, then I would do that, okay? Let's say you guess five questions right, or because you got molecular biology background, you get five of those right in the raw exam. And you only get four right out of the replacement questions. I just keep the five. I just leave your raw score. So whatever way that works to your advantage for your score is what I uh, do for the core thing. All right. So if I replace the questions and you get end up getting less, I don't take that away. But oh, well, you only get, you got four right for the replacement, but you guessed five. Therefore, that'd be a minus one. And I, let me take a point away. I don't do that. Okay, so however it works to your advantage is what I end up doing. All right, so let's kind of start rolling through here. HH equation. What is the key thing that you need to focus on with the HH equation? Hedison Hasselbach equation. It's really going to be right here. Um, so I will be sending out a document. All right in which I pull out what are the key topics 
from my full list of the uh, things that we cover in gem biochemistry that you would need to be focusing on. So it'll be a much more concise document. It'll have the key topics that you want to be focusing on. All right? Um, because those are the four things that they really are going to want to test on. So when it comes to buffers, right, two things that you're going to either do, you're going to calculate um, the pH, which they're not going to ask with an all multiple choice exam question. That's just pointless. But so the final exam, ACS, they want to know, do you understand conceptually how buffers work? Right? And the big concept of the, of the buffer is really the, the ratio of A minus to HA. How much of the conjugate uh, base, how much of the weak acid you have in their ratios, that's going to dictate then, you know, what is the pH of the buffer with respect to the pKa of that weak acid. All right? So at the end of the day, if pH is higher than pKa, then that tells you your solution is more basic, you should have more A minus. pH is less than pKa, that's an indication that your solution is more acidic. You should have more of the weak acid. And pH equal pKa, there should be equal amounts right, of the conjugate acid, conjugate base. All right. Amino acids. We should know all the, the names of our amino acids. We should be able to group them. Does anybody remember the mnemonics for the, the amino acids? Static compound, freeway. So three ways your living, aromatics. Yeah, living well and getting paid is very much fantastic, right? Does anybody remember that? Um, ben, you probably were in the very first fall semester, right? Yeah, your first semester. Yeah, so you didn't quite get there with mnemonics then, but here we go. But they'll be there on that sheet, though, to help you remember the grouping there. So my polar, polar neutral, right, dicon is a Q, looks like an O, so it's there. Um, acids is F, basic is HARC, HRK. Um, and our nonpolar living well and getting paid is very much fantastic. So if you remember that, you can get all your groupings, right? Um, and then our ionizable uh, amino acids, right? So you, that ties into titration, amino acid titrations, right? And amino acids and pH. So you got to know the pKa, right? And the key thing is you got to remember for histidine. Right? Yes, it's a basic amino acid, but at pH 7, it has a neutral charge because its pK for the R group is only 6. Right? So by the time you get to pH 7, anytime your pH is higher than the pKa, you're losing the proton. Right? So if you recall for basic amino acids, if I would draw a general structure, That's the general structure for a basic amino acid. The pK is about 2, this is 6, and this is about 10. So if this is histidine, right? by the time you get to pH 7, which uh, groups, ionizable groups, have lost their proton? This one, and this one. Right? And because we lose H+, plus, it just becomes R, and we lose an H, that becomes minus. Right? And so that's a neutral compound by the time it gets to pH 7. Right? Cystidine, uh, cystine and tyrosine, they behave like acidic amino acids, right? um, but their R group pK is higher than pH 7. All right? So it's, um, the acidic acids, the glutamic acid, and the spartic acid, that R group pK is only about 4, so by the time you get to pH 7, it's lost, and therefore they're minus 1. Cystine and tyrosine only lose it to carboxyl group by pH 7. So then, therefore, you got CO minus Na3 plus RH functionality, so you're still 0. All right. So there's really only 4 amino acids that can have a charge at pH 7. All right. Arginine, lysine, glutamic acid, spartic acid. Okay. We're good with that so far? All right. Um, before I jump up to the enzymes, let me get to the proteins. All right, so the, what are the big things you need to know about proteins? Secondary structures. What are two types of secondary structures for proteins? Oh. Alpha helices and beta sheets. Beta sheets. Right, um, and what is the main core structure? What level is that? At protein level is, is that? 
Secondary. Secondary structure. And what is the main force that holds them together? Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, right? So that's the key thing for both in proteins and nucleic acids only, right, do we see hydrogen bonding, right? Lipids and carbohydrates don't have those hydrogen bonds. All right? Um, so that's going to be the important thing. Make sure you know the different structures. Um, and so we know with uh, beta sheets, right, they're going to have those prolines present, right, because it's a, it's a spherical uh, R group, cyclic R group, so it makes it perfect for that turn. So prolines are great for our beta sheets, but they're awful for alpha helices, right, because the alpha helices, they don't want anything to be rigid in their compound. So alpha helices, you won't have prolines, right? But they're great for a um, beta sheet, right? Allow the turn. All right. Um, tertiary structure versus quaternary structure. What is the important thing there? If you're tertiary versus quaternary, what's the big important difference between those two? Yeah, monomer versus multimer, which takes it to enzymes. And what did you say there, Logan? Allosteric. Non -allosteric. allosteric versus non-allosteric. So which ones are non-allosteric? Tertiary. Tertiary. Monomers, right? So if you're a monomer, you're going to be non-allosteric, which means you're going to uh, go with uh, Michaelis. You're going to follow Michaelis main kinetics, right? If you're a multimer, you're allosteric. You are going to follow cooperative kinetics, right? So make sure you do things. So when we talk about michaelis main kinetics, we talk about the different types of inhibitors, like we talk about competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors, uncompetitive inhibitors, right? For michaelis main non-allosteric tertiary um, enzymes. As soon as you get to quaternary, right now with multimers, we're following cooperative kinetics, we're sigmoidal shape, all those things, right? So make sure you can differentiate between those two. Uh, and always remember, and I'll kind of show that chart again, we might know those differences. And if you get the terminology of one, then you're focusing on that one, all right? Globular versus fibrous proteins. All right, big thing about um, fibrous proteins, right? The easiest way to remember whether or not fibrous protein is soluble or insoluble, if you forget between the two, Think about fiber proteins, just think about your hair, in your nails, and what would happen if you would have uh, cut your hair or cut your nails over the sink, and then you go to wash them down. Are they going to dissolve in that water? No. Nope, it's going to clog your drain, all right, because they are insoluble in water, all right? And because of their parallel arrangement, they have a repetitive structure, all right? So fiber proteins are going to have a very repetitive structure. And the big thing about globular proteins, right, they kind of have that donut shape. What two uh, enzymes did we talk about? Like major enzymes did we talk about? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin and myoglobin, myoglobin right? They have that um, globular shape. And which molecule are they responsible for transporting? Oxygen. Oxygen, which is what in terms of polarity? O2 is what type of molecule in terms of polarity? Nonpolar, all diatomic, so nonpolar, right? If they're perfect non diatomic, H2O2, N2, right? They're all nonpolar um, compounds. So that's a reminder that globular proteins have nonpolar stuff on the inside, right? So if you're going to see a set of amino acids, which uh, amino acids would you expect to be on the inside of a globular protein? Think about our amino acid groupings. Yeah, living, well. living well, getting paid, and very much fantastic. Right? If you see those amino acids, they should be on the inside of a globular protein. If you see any others, they're going to be on the outside of the globular protein. Right? So that was the big thing <coughs> that I know we covered in the class. All right. So we have that. Those are the big things about proteins, and those are core fundamental things. Right? You have to be able to establish the difference between globular fibrous different class of proteins. All right, the techniques here, not so much centrifugation, but column chromatography, big time uh, importance. What you are going to see in the first 40 questions, if there's any questions on chromatography, it's just very simple stuff. It's when you start to get to the core, uh, the beyond that, 
they start, they're going to have quite a few questions there where they're going to have it very much like the exam questions that I had. Here's the information. What does it mean? <laughs> right? It's not going to be just simply, you're going to have to decipher the information and then be able to answer the question. Right? So I've been trying to prepare you for that type of thinking, thought process, because that is the expectation for an advanced biochem uh, students. Right? So you're going to see a lot of stuff in there with, get, with regard to protein purification, all that stuff, like the different techniques. And you're going to have to be able to sort through that information and identify that what might be the person. All right, so we have polymer chromatography. What are the two main types of chromatography in addition to affinity chromatography? Get that out of the way. They don't care about that. Ionic change. Which one? Ionic change. Ionic change and... How well can you separate protein size by inclusion. size inclusion, right? So size inclusion uh, chromatography, what is the elution order? Big Make sure you know those elution orders. Big first, small last. Big first, small last, right? So the larger molecules elute first. So you should be able to see an elution diagram, right, for that chromatography technique and be able to know, okay, with respect to time, right, the larger molecules would have looped first, the smaller molecules would have looped later, right? And then with gel filtration, right, that you can, can compare that. And I know I did this for those who took my lab and that lab biochem final, right? Where I had you say, okay, if this was the order for size exclusion, but here's your band, tell me the order that you see on the FDS page band, right? You should be able to compare that to FDS page. What is the migration order in FDS page? Um, huh? The opposite. The opposite, right? In migration, smaller molecules migrate further down the vertical gel, right? So if you remember, if you see a molecular weight ladder, it's going to be higher, and then they're going to work their way down to the smaller ones, right? So that's the big thing with um, gel filtration and FDS page, so here we go. So larger molecules first. And so whether it be volume or time, right, the larger one's going to come out first, and then the smaller one's going to come out uh, later. How about ionic change? What is the key thing uh, there for ionic change? The cation. Yeah. Anion, cationic change. So if you're doing anionic change, which one gets eluted first? The positive, the opposite charge, right? You're capturing the one that you're exchanging, all right? So if you are trying to get anions, you're going to capture the anions, and the cations and the neutral substances will loop further mm -hmm. along the way. So then we can then wash our uh, column with high salt concentration, right? And the if you're doing anion exchange, the cations and the neutral substances will loot out first. And then you're going to loot last, right? The stuff you want to capture is going to be anions. That is the opposite for cation exchange, right? If you want to capture the cations, that's going to loot out last, right? So make sure you remember that thing there. So the elution order. We talked about FDS page. Here's the other one, IDF. All right. Big thing here, so they show pretty much all of these little proton, like these protein uh, circles, about similar size. All right, the size of those uh, circles do matter. Okay, so I'm gonna point that out. If you see a smaller circle, that means less protein. If you see a bigger circle, that means you got more protein present. Right, no different from a band on a gel. Right, if you see a very small faint band. On a regular FDS page gel, you got a little bit of protein. You see a thick, big, fat band, you got a lot of protein. So the same thing here. So this is obviously a 2D technique we talked about with isoelectric focusing, right? So you can separate by size, but then also by pH, all right? Um, so for this molecule here, what would you, what would you think is your rough estimate PI for that substance? One right here, what do you think is the PI, rough estimate? I think it might be the isoelectric point. 
where I bet tonight? Around four. Yeah, around four. Look where it's sitting at, right? So this is nothing more than a pH gradient. All right, so isoelectric focusing gel is nothing more than a pH gradient that you have. And your samples will sort themselves out and they will migrate until they reach the pH that is equal to their PI. All right? So it doesn't matter where you start them, they will migrate accordingly toward their PI, their isoelectric point. All right, so the PA that matches their isoelectric point. So make sure you remember. So once you have them separated out, so okay, here's a pH 4, or roughly about pH 0.5. So then the two things you can tell about this molecule is it's probably the third lightest protein. Because right, you can compare it to this one and this one here. So it's the third lighting protein, and yet it has the lowest pH. Right. Here, you can say this is the heaviest protein, and it has the highest pH. So 2D IEF can give you information about two things. It can give you the molecular weight and roughly the PI for the substance. Right. FDS page just allows us to only get the molecular weight. Okay? That makes sense? All right. So that's going to be certainly an important topic here. It's just more of that, just showing you how it works, how they migrate until they get to their PI, and then they all stop. Right? So you can figure out, based on where they're located, their rough isoelectric point. All right. Um, in terms of identifying the protein, as well, so if you want to start identifying the protein, run HPLC to separate out your amino acids. How would you actually start to identify them though? Proteomics, anybody know proteomics? What's a major technique in proteomics? We'll come back, we'll see it shortly. Anybody know the major technique in proteomics that allows us to identify the amino acids after you separate them? GCMS. Huh? GCMS. The MS portion. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mass spec, right. So HPLC is a form of chromatography, right? So you could do GCMS, you could do HPLC MS, right? But the mass spec portion is what allows you to actually identify your amino acids, right? Based on the molecular weight. All right. Uh, let's see. Move on down here. Eliza Wechter Blot. You need to know this, all right? So we should all know, you got your target of interest, right? Target protein of interest. What binds to the target protein? Primary. Primary antibody binds to the target protein. What binds to the primary? Secondary. Secondary antibody. And then what's bound to the secondary? Substrate. Not quite. Enzyme. Conjugate enzyme. You need your conjugate enzyme to be bound to your secondary enzyme. So therefore, then you could add the... Substrate. Substrate to then identify your protein, right? So the secondary antibody has to have a conjugated enzyme with it. Then throw in the substrate, you get your product, right? So there we go. Secondary body, bound to the primary, conjugated enzyme covalent linked to the secondary antibody. Throw in your substrate, you get a product. Right? That same is true for both Eliza and Western blotting in terms of that order, right? And here it is, analyzed by mass spectroscopy. Right? So once you separate out your protein, then you can analyze by mass spec. Right? So that's a big important thing. All right, so how are we following so far? Good. Doing good? All right. The big, big, big topic so far right, is what we've been covering so far up here. And then we'll get to carbohydrate metabolism. Um, okay. All right, so when it comes to enzymes, right? The big thing you need to be able to sort out is you need to understand this principle here. What does an enzyme not change? What does it not affect? It's a fundamental uh, thing, threshold concept in biochemistry. The products of the reaction. Huh? The products of the reaction. No. The, um, the, the word G or something like that. Like the change between the reactants and the products. That difference? Change, yeah. You know, everybody know what that called? That difference? Delta. 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 Delta something. Delta. 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 How do we know if a reaction is spontaneous or not? Delta G. Delta G gives free energy. Right? And enzyme does not affect 
delta G for the equilibrium constant. That is a fundamental, that's a threshold concept in biochemistry. It's amazing how many students fail to understand that. Enzymes do not affect delta G. That is why we have reaction coupling and activation in, the, in biochemistry, right? Biological reactions. Because the enzymes themselves cannot make a reaction go if it's non spontaneous. They need to couple it to a reaction or activate the molecule to get the energy to drive a non spontaneous reaction. Yet they can make them go 10 to the 20 times faster than they would normally go under uh, non enzymatic situations, non catalyzed situations. But they cannot make a reaction that's non spontaneous actually go. All right? So that is a fundamental thing. Make sure you have that in your head, right? You cannot change delta G to give free energy for a reaction. Right? It has no effect on that whatsoever. Here it is, right? Yes, they can drop the hill, which is the activation energy, right? They bring down that hill, but they can't change the overall free energy. All right? Michaelis met in kinetics. What is first order kinetics versus zero order, right? So first order is when they directly relate to each other, right? And then eventually, when do you get, why do we get the zero order kinetics all of a sudden? Because we reached saturation. saturation, right? An enzyme can only move so so fast, right? If you think about if you were working on an assembly line and you were able to cap 10 bottles a minute, you got two bottles, you cap two in a minute. You got four, you cap four. You got eight, you cap eight. You got 10, you cap 10. But what if you got 11 bottles? Cap 10. You're capping 10. You can't move any faster. What about if you got 30 bottles? Still capping 10 in a minute, right? You're not going to move any faster. You're going to backlog, but you're not going to move any faster. All right? So that's when we go from there. Yeah. Right? We should know what KM and what that represents, right? The higher the KM, that is bad for an enzyme, right? We want lower KMs for it to be more effective for an enzyme. That's why inhibitors, like a competitive inhibitor, what do they do to the KM? Increase your they increase the KM, right? They force you to have to have even more of that substrate present in order for the reaction to go. So enzymes want lower KM. What about their KCAT, catalytic efficiency, or the turnover number that represents? Would you want a higher turnover number or a smaller turnover number? Higher. You want higher, right? So you want to have higher turnover numbers, you want to have higher catalytic efficiency, you want to have a lower KM. So if you have some type of inhibitor, or you have some type of mutation or whatever to the enzyme, amino acids, and you see all of a sudden a change in the KM, it gets increased, that means that's a deleterious effect to that enzyme, right? Um, so kind of keep that in mind. What does it mean when you are KM? What does it mean in terms of the catalytic uh, Turnover number, right? KCAT and all that stuff. All right, so that's what I have here, right? So inhibitors, right? The different types of inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors. Once again, what, what type of uh, molecule, what type of enzyme are we talking about in terms of protein structure? Exports. Huh? Or competitive inhibitors. Tertiary, right? So what type of kinetics are we following? Michaelis-Menten. So that means we're not following cooperative, we're not doing sigmoidal, we're not doing any of that, right? No allotheric effects, right? So keep that in mind. So the big difference between an uncompetitive inhibitor and the other two guys there, an uncompetitive inhibitor cannot bind to the free enzyme. That's why I call it uncompetitive. It can't compete whatsoever. A non-competitive, so the terminology is important, non-competitive means I could compete, I just choose not to. I'm like the third wheel. I'll let you interact, and then I'll bother you and all that stuff. So I could, but I'd really rather not. Competitive is directly competing with the free enzyme. Non-competitive, they don't have to. Uncompetitive, they can only bind to the ES, right? The enzyme substrate complex. All right. Whereas in chapter seven. Right. Here's the big difference, right? Now all of a sudden we're cooperative enzymes, right? Because we're allosteric, because we've got a quaternary structure. So the terminology for the inhibitors is very different, right? We only call them B system or K system, so they directly tell you which type of inhibitor uh, that they're, what, what are they acting upon there, right? So be able to sort that out straight away.
All right. So we should all know about cooperativity with that. We get to the enzyme mechanism. Um, the big thing, how many phases for the enzyme mechanism, chymotrypsin? How many stages there were, if I remember? There were the two stages. Right, in the first stage, you have nucleophilic attack by the serine, 195. And then you would have the cleavage by hydrolysis, right, to free up your carbon carboxylate product here. So one of the things here about the histidine, all right, you notice it starts with a hydrogen, and now it doesn't have that hydrogen because the hydrogen got transferred to the amino group. So what type of behavior is histidine showing there by giving up its hydrogen? Gave up its proton. So we talk about the different types of catalysts here. Right? So it's part of that catalytic uh, thing there. It gave up its proton. What type of substance did it give up proton? Hmm? Acids. Acids. Right? So that histidine 57 is behaving like an acid in that uh, mechanism there. Right? Because what are you seeing happening to the histidine? Right? Started with the hydrogen. It's going to take it, and then it's going to transfer it to this guy here, right? So behaving like a nasty there, okay? So donating that first time. All right, so that's enzyme stuff. In chapter 8, the big thing here is, let's see here. Well, let's talk about transition states real quick. Maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah. So the big thing with a transition state, right, if anybody remember the transition state analogs and all that stuff, right, so they're great inhibitors because they're able to outcompete with the substrate, right? And the reason why is because they actually mimic the substrate um, product transition state, right? So it's actually, they, they mimic the molecule that's even further along in the reaction. So the enzyme can be even more likely to bind to your transition state. Right? So once again, that will be highlighted in the uh, document that I'll be sharing with you guys. All right. So we should all know the core things for the biological membrane. Right? Polar head, not polar tail. Fluidity, right? Saturation, double bonds, single bonds, right? Driving forces, hydrophobic interactions. We should know that. Uh, we should know membrane transport and the fluid uh, mosaic model. So the key thing about the fluid mosaic model is thing can only move laterally, right? Um, even the lipids themselves, they can only the tails only go like that, right? Nothing can flip flop, transfer, or anything like that, right? So. Fluid mosaic, so it's a fluid motion, just kind of lateral motion, left and right, everything that way. Nothing go flipping across. All right. Um, let's see here. Membrane transport, two types. What's the main difference between the two? Spends energy. Yeah, one requires energy, one does not. Right. So that's kind of the big deal. If you are doing any type of diffusion. Right? Yes, you may have a helper molecule facilitate it, but it still doesn't require energy, right? So the big difference between those two is the energy involvement there. Uh, we should know what receptors do. The clayic acid, the big thing here. How do we read our primary sequence? I prime to three prime, right? That's a fundamental thing that they would expect you to know, that I would certainly expect you to know, right? And you certainly should know at this point, talk about transcription, translation, all that stuff, right? The GC pairing, right? GCs have three hydrogen bonds. AT is two hydrogen bonds. Why is that important? Because it ties into the melting temp, right? The higher the GC content, the higher the melting temp, right? Because you're breaking more hydrogen bonds, right? Um, so the way they could, they act that could be very different, though. They may not, they might not necessarily say you have this percentage of G and C. They might just say you have this percentage of G, but then it corresponds to G C, 
they could add how much, what percentage of T you have. That correspond to A and T together, right? And then the opposite of that is how much GC. So if you want to compare the melting temp, you want to focus on the GC content. The higher that is, then the more higher the temperature. All right. It's like that. Carbohydrates real quickly here. We should know coupling, stuff like that, and then we get the carbs. This is a big one here. Uh, reducing sugar versus non-reducing sugar. The key thing there is free anomeric carbon versus no free anomeric carbon. Right? This is a non-reducing sugar because there's no free anomeric carbon here. This is not the anomeric carbon. Even if you assume that was the anomeric carbon, there's no OH there. All right? So therefore, it wouldn't be a free OH. All right? Here is the anomeric carbon, carbon 1, OH. Anomeric carbon, carbon 1, OH. All you need is one free anomeric uh, OH, and you have a reducing sugar. Okay? The sugar can be 10,000 sugar residues long, and if that last one is a, has a free anomeric OH, it's a reducing sugar. Right, does that make sense? All right. The nice thing is we're not on the lecture clock here. We're to a left. And we can go even slightly longer than uh, there. So, yeah. All right. Let's see here. Okay. We should definitely know our major disaccharides. There's only three we talked about. Sucrose, lactose, maltose, right? We should know our major monosaccharides, glucose and fructose and galactose, right? So we talked about three major monosaccharides, three major disaccharides, and everything else with polysacs that were part of those, right? So disaccharides, lactose and galactose and glucose, sucrose is fructose and glucose, and uh, maltose is two D glucose together, right? So make sure you can differentiate between your mono, dyes, and oligosaccharides. Okay. Uh, let's see here. How are we doing so far? Yeah. And then that takes us to the big thing here. One fourth of your exam in carbohydrates and tablet. Great. It was 15 out of 40, and now it's 15 out of 60. One fourth of the exam in carbohydrate metabolism. Right? We should feel a little bit comfortable now. We kind of been tying back to it a little bit and stuff like that. So you want to make sure you know glycolysis pathway in and out, right? Particularly, you know, what are the reaction steps? What are those enzymes involved? Right? You're gonna to want to refresh your memory um, there. We all, I know I've certainly made sure that you do the three major control point enzymes, right? But you're also going to want to make sure you know, like, you know, or what's your aldolase? Which reaction step care, uh, do you think the enolase might be involved in? Just based on its name. Enolase. So try to think about which one has a product that has enol in it. Oh my gosh. So you finally got used to the, the, the short name, but PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate, reaction step number nine, right? That has your enolase, right? I knew it was at the end, too. Yeah. Cleavage step is carried out by aldolase, right? So make sure you know those, right? Um, so that way, I could ask you, or they could ask you about any reaction there, and you should be able to know where to react with respect to the pathway, right? So you should know the reaction step number six, right? NADH generated, right? The oxidation reaction. Um, step three, reaction step four is our cleavage step, right? Reaction step five is the isomerization from DHAP to G3P, right? So make sure you revisit these pathways right, to make sure you're comfortable with that. Right, so different control points. 
Alright. A big, big thing is chapter 18. This is always a sticky point for a lot of uh, folks here. Alright. This is important. Alright. This uh, figure right there. And it all comes down to really the major thing you need to know. All right, so the big thing about phosphorylase B is in the muscle. Phosphorylase A is in the liver. Phosphorylase A, the active form, right, it, it going to be phosphorylated. So that's the other thing that you should know here. Um, this one is phosphorylated. And this one here is non-phosphorylated. So it is the hormones that will lead to this phosphorylation via the PKA pathway, right, cyclic AMP, that whole idea, right, activation of PKA, then we are going to phosphorylate phosphorylase A. Phosphorylase A is controlled by two hormones, glucagon and epinephrine. Glucagon is stimulated by the liver. The key thing you need to keep in mind about the liver the liver's main goal it is to supply the blood stream with glucose, to reestablish blood glucose levels. All right? So what are going to be things that you're going to want to do to, uh, to supply the blood stream with glucose? You're going to want to do glycogen breakdown. Right? And you're going to want to go through gluconeogenesis. All right? Because everything's about getting glucose to the bloodstream, right? So, phosphorylase B, glucagon, right? Hey, we need to get blood glucose, so therefore we're gonna do the liver, want to do glycogen breakdown, the liver, want to do gluconeogenesis, all right? So, always kinda keep that in mind when you have liver, Versus the muscle. Gluconeogenesis. And then the liver the muscle went to do glycolysis. Kind of keep those two things in the back of your mind, right? So if I'm the liver, I want to do gluconeogenesis because I want to supply blood glucose. Look. But I need to make glucose. I go through glycogen breakdown, right? If I'm in the muscle, I will also do gly uh, glycogen breakdown. But now my role is to go through glycolysis because I want to provide energy for my muscles. That makes sense, right? So two different things here. There. They both will go through glycogen breakdown, but for two very different reasons. Liver saying, "Hey, break it down, so I can." Create the uh, glucose in the bloodstream. Right. So, epinephrine, stimulated by the muscle, but why would it activate the liver phosphorylase? The reason why is epinephrine, does anybody know what the common name for epinephrine is? Adrenal. 
adrenaline, which is our fight or flight hormone, right? You need lots of energy in your muscle. Phosphorylase B is under conditions where, hey, you probably haven't eaten uh, since breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning and now at 2 o'clock. You just need a little bit of extra energy in the muscle because you've already uh, used up, consumed all your food stores, right? That you just ate your meal, you consumed that all up. So you need a little bit of extra. So you tap into your glycogen stores in your muscle. Break that down. But if you're fight or flight, you need a surge of sugar to be running through uh, glycolysis. So therefore, you got to stimulate glycogen breakdown in the liver, get it to the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream will transport that quickly to the muscle, and then the muscle can go through glycolysis. Does anybody see that big difference there? It's a core difference there. That's why they're both stimulating glycogen breakdown from the liver, but the one is just saying, hey, I just need to get my blood glucose levels up. You got hypoglycemia. Epinephrine is saying, we need tons of glucose now in the muscle, transport it quickly. Right? It's, it's like a five alarm fire. It's like, woo, 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 get that thing transported fast. We need to run through glycolysis immediately. We need a lot of energy coming from the blood. All right, so everybody, everybody got that? All right, so then the key regulators of these two pathways then is F2-6BP. Right? And I will show you where that all comes from. Everybody remember this, right? f 2 bp is the key regulator for that. If you make f 2 bp all right, you're going to go through glycolysis because f 2 bp is an allotheric activator of PFK1. And it's an allotheric inhibitor of F1 sick BPAs. Right? So if you've got high levels of F2 sick BP, you're going to shut down like um, gluconeogenesis and you're going to activate glycolysis. All right? So remember, glycolysis has PFK1. Gluconeogenesis has F1 sick BPs. Does that make sense there? All right. Doing all right so far? So that kind of a biggie, biggie thing here. We should obviously know the difference between a receptor agonist and antagonist, right? The agonist elicits the response we want. The antagonist blocks this response, right? That's how drug inhibitors work, right? Insulin promotes activation of glycogen synthase. We should remember that, right? Because it's putting the body in an anabolic situation. So if glycogen phosphorylase is activated by phosphorylation, right? How do you think we turn off glycogen phosphorylase and activate synthesis? We need to, what do we need to, yeah, we need to dephosphorylate, right, our phosphorylase to allow for the activation of glycogen synthesis, right, because they, they parallel, they're anti-parallel with each other, all right? So in order for this to be activated, we need dephosphorylated glycogen phosphorylase, all right? Now, so the key thing then, if insulin is doing that, it's going to do that in the liver, right? So remember, uh, insulin puts the body in the anabolic state. Its control of glycogen is going to be in the liver, right? Because the role is there to get it to the bloodstream, right? If we're adipose tissue, then we're controlling fatty acid synthesis and things of that nature, right? So be mindful of what organ you're dealing with when you're talking about insulin, right? And the control that it has, all right? Uh, let's see here. Corey cycle. Does anybody remember this here? The basic thing here, the Corey cycle, 
Glycolysis occurs in the muscle. You ship that lactate to the liver, you run through gluconeogenesis. Because remember, glycolysis in the muscle, liver carries out gluconeogenesis. So if you keep that in mind, you'll be okay, right? So one of the topics that they asked about is called the glucose alanine cycle. And it's pretty much the exact same thing, except for the only difference is instead of the end point being lactate, it's alanine. <laughs> right? So you go from glucose to pyruvate to alanine in the glucose alanine cycle. And then alanine will get shipped to the liver and go alanine, pyruvate, glucose. But at the same premise at the 40 cycle. Right? Glycolysis occurs in the which organ? Muscle. Glycolysis occurs in the muscle. Gluconeogenesis occurs in the yeah. liver. Keep that in mind. You'll be just fine uh, with that topic there. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Pentose phosphate pathway. Right. We should know that our products. NADPH, R5P, and a byproduct is CO2, right, of the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, so anytime we're going to make, uh, we're going to go through PPP is because we need to make NADPH, we need to make R5P, and then we end up generating CO2. You want to make sure you understand this uh, mechanism here, right, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay, um, complex here, understand the role for each of those, sort of like the lipoic acid here in transferring the acetyl group, all right, so that's the role of that lipoic acid. TPP, all right, we always see this uh, compound thiamine pyrophosphate anytime there's a decarboxylation occurring, all right, you will see that TPP, so that's why that HET, that's why you get HETPP, all right, so Thiamine pyrophosphates are important because we're losing CO2. Yeah. Okay. So anytime you see that, you should expect to see TPP hanging around. All right. Uh, let's see here. PCA cycle. Major thing there is just understanding the order of the reactions, right, for the TCA cycle, um, where they're at. Because what the effect that's going to have then on the control of further enzymes upstream, right? So if you have a product downstream of an enzyme in a, in a pathway, what happens to that enzyme? Turned on or turned off? You turn it off, right? Anything that's present downstream turns the upstream enzyme off. Anything downstream from an enzyme, like anything that's upstream, will turn the enzyme on, right? So. Should know that. We should know about anaplerotic uh, reactions, right? Remember the TCA cycle, anaplerotic. Their job is to replace, right, the intermediates of the TCA cycle. All right, so think of a black terminal. Things are going out, we well, need to replace them back in. So those are the anaplerotic reactions, right, in order to keep everything running smooth. Chapter 20, electron transport chain. We should know the order of those steps. The key thing you got to remember is NADH goes into complex one. FADH2 goes into complex two. All right, so that's the key thing there. Should know the difference between pH, right? The matrix has a lower, uh, higher pH, right? Remember the proton gradient goes from the matrix to the inner mitochondrial space. Right. So if we look at it here, here's our matrix, here's our inner mitochondrial space, so proton concentration is higher here, therefore we should have a lower pH there, and a higher pH in the matrix. All right. We should understand that delta G is, all, is negative, it's a spontaneous reaction. When you tie that to a cell potential, the cell potential E reaction must be what sign in order for the reaction to be spontaneous? Like that. Got to be positive. E reaction must be positive in order to have a spontaneous reaction, right? Um, so just kind of bear that in mind. You know, so if they ask you to do any kind of calculations, just keep in mind. Well, if it's spontaneous, E reaction needs to be positive. 
right? So that's a fundamental thing there. Notice order of the reaction steps, right? So NADH complex one, FADH complex two, right? Complex three uh, is getting cytochrome C, CoQ to cytochrome C. Complex four converts from cytochrome C to oxygen, right? So make sure you understand the roles for each of those complexes. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the major deal for most of the material. Um, and then even the stuff that is the newer material, I'll highlight it in the, the document thing, but really transcription, translation, replication, right? You kind of know the steps. Right, and that's how I had y'all kind of really talk it out and say, like, okay, what is happening in those, those big things, right? So you would know the major steps and what are the things that they're gonna, they could potentially pick out on, right? Um, other than that, and then fatty acid oxidation, fatty acid synthesis is more tied to the control, the insulin and stuff like that, right? Check out the mTOR pathway, those papers, right? Make sure you understand how mTOR is being regulated. Right, and what things turn it on, what things turn it off. Um, and then nitrogen metabolism, amino acid metabolism, right, and once again, I'll highlight it uh, in those documents for you so that you know what to look for. But the key thing there is, um, you know, the urea cycle, right, what are your products of the urea cycle, right, and then what are the things that we tend to see when you're doing amino acid metabolism, right, so what are the cofactors involved in stuff like that, okay? Any questions otherwise? But that's it, like I said. So I think if you get a 40 out of 60, I think you're in really, really good shape. So that's kind of the goal. So like I said, 40 questions, the core stuff. So it's not new material, but right? it's only the additional 20. And, like, and some of those questions are even stuff from the Gen Biochem. I think we should be in good shape at 23. Put it fine. Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you all Friday. Is the final in here? Yes, it is. Her. Final will be here. Um, I sent out, in that email I sent out, I asked if people wanted to do a Friday morning, like for those who weren't here.